Welcome to Charity Therapy, a podcast from Birkin Law about building better nonprofits. I'm your host, Jess Birkin. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Charity Therapy. I'm here today with my co host, Megan, and we've got more nonprofit questions for your listening pleasure. Megan, how are you? Jess, I am so good. Happy to be here today. How are you? I'm good. We're in the winter wonderland, and I have an exchange student from Spain living with us right now. And, you know, we're in Minnesota, and the other day they were like, Jess, I went to the bus stop and I stood outside for just two minutes and my hair froze. <laughs> they were very concerned. It was cute. And I'm sorry to tell them that it will be getting even more frozen very soon. <laughs> right? They were like, is it like this all the time? I was like, um, actually, it's not even that cold right now. <laughs> yeah, we've like just had our first cold snap here in Minnesota. It is not uh... nearly at the depths of winter. So she has a lot to expect. Yep. So let's get on with our episode today. Jess, I've got some like board governance questions for you, specifically questions about like voting and how your like board decisions are supposed to actually happen. Before we dive in, can you give us a little information about how a healthy board should operate when they're trying to get stuff done? Yeah. So uh, this varies, but Generally, I would say that you want to make sure that you're having a real discussion. We want to make sure everyone is heard. So it can't just be like the one person in the room that never shuts up gets to talk and other people never get to say anything. Then I would say we need to get rid of Robert's rules. If you're not using Robert's rules, good for you. If you are, just know that you don't have to. Yeah, you and should go have listen to our ranty <laughs> yeah. podcast about it. <laughs> right. We got a whole episode about that. Um, you need to make decisions. You don't need to make those decisions so bureaucratic that it's impossible to get anything done. Make sure that you've got good records of your meetings. That's how you show that you're executing your fiduciary duties. So good meeting minutes are not a transcript of every single thing that happened, but they are enough to show who was at the meeting, the date, time, and location, even if that's over a web meeting, and then enough description of the discussions to know that like a full and fair discussion was had. But it's not, first Jess said this, and then Megan said that, and then Jess said this, and then Megan said that, that that's not necessary. So I think if you keep those kind of principles in mind, have a have a real discussion, make sure everyone participates. Don't use Robert's rules and overly overly formal process and make sure you keep good records. You're in pretty good shape. It doesn't even sound that complicated, which is why you said like, you know, it can vary a lot. Yep. All right. So first question today. I am the president of a small organization and I'm one of three board members. Our secretary is dealing with a brain injury after a car wreck ra- last week, and he'll be unavailable for about two months for his recovery. But with only two board members present, do we have to put everything on hold until he comes back? Or can we keep making decisions and moving forward with only two board members? Mm. Well, the short answer is yes. You can keep moving forward because if you have three board members... A simple majority is probably your quorum. I don't know this, but I'm assuming that you have a simple majority for quorum. And if you have two out of three, you can theoretically proceed with your meetings and votes. From a practical standpoint, though, you're going to want to keep that board member updated as the weeks go by so that they are informed and ready to return to meetings when they're recovered. Right, right. So... Jess, I know you have like personal experience with this particular situation. What happens if the secretary needs more than two months to recover or runs into issues with their recovery and decides they can't return to the board at all? What do they do? Yeah, so uh, you're exactly right. I've been dealing with post-concussion syndrome for like over a year. So I know how important the recovery time is. And if this board member is not able to return to their board role, 
And, you know, how do we know it's going to be two months? We're being very optimistic and we hope that they are going to recover, but brain injuries are are goofy and weird. We don't, we don't really know what's going to happen, right? So he may not be able to return to his role at all. He may not be able to return for a while. He may decide that he needs to leave the board. You know, you think it'll be two months. We don't know how long it's going to take. Brain injuries are hard to deal with. You may want to start recruiting another person, not to replace this director necessarily, but it would be a good idea for a board of three who's down a person to bring someone else on board and do it in the space where you know you have some time because you're not below a legal limit uh, or a legal minimum right now, but you could be. Um, so it's a good time to beef up the team because functioning with two in the long term is not great. What if you have a conflict of interest and there's only the two of you? Then one person votes? No, that's crazy. Um, and if this board member isn't able to recover quickly it, or just decides that being on this board is something that's got to go, then you're better off having a backup person than dipping under a legal limit. And technically that third director isn't really allowed to quit until you find a replacement. At least that's how it works where we're sitting in Minnesota, where the minimum viable number of board members is three. So you have to maintain three. So I would go out and get a fourth right now and plan for the reality that inevitably someone will leave. If not this person, someone will leave. And then what? Right. You don't want to be acting out of a place of desperation because you're already out of compliance. It's like, if you know this could be a possibility, let's just prepare now. (laughs) Yep. All right. Uh, On to our next question. So question number two, we have been dealing with some contentious issues lately, and the board is having trouble coming to a consensus about how to move forward. Our president has made it clear that if we try to vote on this particular issue at the upcoming board meeting, he will abstain from voting. Is this allowed? We only have three board members, so it doesn't make sense to vote without him. Okay. There's not a whole lot of facts here. Like, what's the contentious issue? Are there any conflicts of interest? I don't know any of that. But what I do know is we should not allow abstaining. It's, it's just a bad practice on nonprofit boards. In my experience, people most often want to abstain to avoid interpersonal conflict. They don't really have a good reason for abstaining most of the time, especially here in the Midwest where lots of people are not direct communicators and telling someone no can seem very difficult. Abstaining is used in government to sort of avoid going on the record as voting for or against something, or to block, or, you know, it's it's a tactic. And in nonprofits, I'm going to say this again, and I feel like a broken record, nonprofits are not government. We do not have to act like government light. And when we use Robert's rules, we start acting like government light. Abstaining really, in my view, has no place in small nonprofit boards, because we are all required to execute our fiduciary duties. People need to just learn to be okay with small group discussion where we disagree. It's okay, folks, to disagree. It's okay to vote no on something. (laughs) Maybe someday you'll be proven right and your no vote is a good thing to have on record. All the board members have fiduciary duties. We can't just be like, I don't feel like voting. This is icky. So you fulfill your duty when you participate in all the aspects of the governance that you are supposed to participate in. And that means that we have to vote when we can. Voting is how we uphold our duties to protect the organization. Exactly. Like, I wish I could just not vote and not deal with it is not an acceptable position. That's not why you're on the board. No, in this question, it feels like the president is trying to hold the board hostage by saying, I'm not going to vote. Like, that's some sort of barrier to them, like, holding the vote. Um, which is not a thing in case anyone's like, well, can't the president like stop the vote from happening? No, no, that's not the president's role. And on top of that, sometimes we have to make difficult decisions. Sometimes it sucks being on a board. Sometimes we have to choose between two bad options. 
that's part of board service. Everyone needs to show up, be prepared, and vote what's in the best interest of the organization. Now, I will call out here because there's always somebody in the room who wants to point out, well, what if the person is too new? You know, there's always someone who's like, well, I'm too new and I don't know enough to vote on this. But you know what that tells me? That the nonprofit is failing at new board member training, new board member orientation and onboarding. Don't send a new board member into a situation where they're going to feel ill-equipped to make a decision. I'm sorry, but like do the work to bring them up to speed. So if you have a new board member who's trying to abstain, that means you've failed to do your job. Give them the past meeting minutes. Give them the underlying documents. Take the time to fill them in ahead of the next meeting. The second they're voting on the board, then they have to execute their duties. There's not like board member light, you know? If you feel like you can't accomplish that for some reason because of the way your organization works or like things are percolating for six months at a time and you just somehow really could never bring someone up to speed, then you need to consider altering your board structure and have a program in place where new board members don't officially take their seats right away, have them come to board meetings as a non-voting director a few times, but do something to make sure your new board members can be board members when they are voting. So that's a Total rant on that answer. Sorry. <laughs> yep. I get I get fired up about abstaining. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell it all, Jess. Nerd alert. All right. I've got one last question for you. We are having trouble making quorum at our board meeting. We have a pretty large board, 25 in total, and our bylaws state that we must have 75% of the board present for quorum. How can we ever get anything done? Most meetings we have, we don't have more than 15 people show up. Okay, that is a redonk quorum. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, so we have the quorum issue and we have the way too many people on the board issue. 25 is way too many. I, I want to know, like, why do they have an entire football team's worth of board members? And with a quorum of 75%, they have to get like 18 or 19 people to show up at every meeting. And it also doesn't even make sense. Like it did it on a calculator and 75% is like 18.7. So oh, good. Yeah. So it's like right. what, you, you need to bring a magician and their assistant and they cut someone in half and bring that person. But two thirds of that person. Anyway, sounds like it's time to reduce the number of people on the board and or change the quorum. Plus, okay, now I'm, I'm inferring because there's nothing in here that says this, but in my experience, organizations that have these really giant boards come about because we have a smaller faction of the board and oftentimes that's the executive committee who is doing most of the actual work and the rest of the board members just show up and rubber stamp things. Sometimes we have a giant board because... Every time somebody gives a boatload of money, we give them a board seat, which is a really bad practice. So growing your board to a ridiculous size because of fundraising stuff is not a good strategy because every individual director needs to be fulfilling their fiduciary duties, which includes showing up to meetings and being aware of what's going on. So when you have an executive committee that's like the secret inside board that actually does the work, you're actually depriving those other board members of doing their work that they need to do. So don't do that. Now, okay, that's the number thing. But the 75% quorum thing, when I'm working with my clients on their bylaws, I always, almost always advise them against Anything that's going to make their governance more difficult than it has to be. It's not easy to run a board. It's not easy to run a nonprofit. You might aspirationally wish for 100% participation. You might want 75% of your board members to participate. But if you can't get 75% of the people in the room, you still need to be able to meet. So I generally recommend sticking with a simple majority, like 51% is good. Like that way, when you're in a sticky spot, like you are now needing to change your governance documents, it's not impossible to make a decision and move forward. Because if you can't meet quorum, you can't vote. 
So now you right. have to like get on the phone and call everybody and be like, yo, I need you to come to a meeting because we can't do anything if you're not there. And then if these people were added to the board because they're major gifts, people, do you really want to call that person and pressure that? You know, it's just this whole negative feedback cycle can start to happen. Absolutely. So just then, like, we're at this place where clearly they need to be changing a few things, both the number of board members and potentially the quorum as well. Like, how do you even go about doing that? Well, I mean, they, they're they going to have to change their bylaws for sure. Right. And obviously, I don't have a copy of their bylaws in front of me, but their bylaws obviously are saying the quorum and their bylaws are saying how many members are on the board. Um, what we don't know is if the 25 is a minimum or if they've just sort of like grown, like their floor might be seven and they've somehow grown to have 25 and now their quorum makes no sense. So there is a reality where they could just change the quorum to be more realistic, but they need to change their bylaws. And I have a sinking suspicion that an organization with a 25 person board and a 75% quorum has a lot of bureaucracy baked into their bylaws. So I'm definitely going to recommend that they should get it help from an attorney. They probably need to do a full reset, just really look at their governance model and see if it even makes sense because it sounds very heavy. But besides the bylaws issue, if you're trying to shrink the board, that is a people problem because you don't want to hurt people's feelings. And that could be a real concern for this board. And it may be the case that the people who aren't showing up didn't really want to be on the board. Maybe they would be more interested in being appointed to an advisory board that meets once or twice a year. But if you suddenly call them and say, hey, we're kicking you off the board, that doesn't feel very good. So the way that you need to kind of like finesse the people issues here is can be complex, right? Because you're going to manage all of the relationships. And, you know, if they want to still be involved or you still want them to be donors um, or whatever the case may be, you could still call them a board member by creating an advisory board and appoint them to an advisory board. And then you keep them kind of in the fold, but they don't have fiduciary duties. They're not required to show up at meetings that they clearly don't want to go to. This is just a great way to keep people engaged and keep getting their perspective on things, which can be really valuable without having all of the formal legal requirements and having your quorum impacted. That's just my two cents. Granted, without a lot, a lot of context from this listener to go through. Right. So I have a couple takeaways based on our conversation here. First is just that board members have fiduciary duties. And when they are on the board, they need to be fulfilling those. So they need to be showing up. They need to be voting in the best interests of the organization. You don't give someone a board seat just because you want them to feel good. Like a board member has real obligations. So that's the first one. Secondly, the size of your board can matter a lot, whether that's it's small and you lose someone and now you need to scramble, or it's really, really big and overgrown and complicated. <laughs> size matters. <laughs> oh, dear. So yeah, you just want to keep an eye on what is really an ideal number of people on your board and don't make it really complicated for your future selves with governance because when you're dealing with a group of people, it might get complicated anyways. So. And the last one, as Jess said, nonprofits are not government and they don't need to act like government. So we are not abstaining from votes or using crazy bureaucratic processes in order to get stuff done. The whole point of a nonprofit board is that y'all can collaborate and make decisions and move the nonprofit forward, not block each other or do anything crazy. Good job. I got nothing to add. All right. Well, Megan, as always, thank you for being here. Um, Folks, if you enjoyed this episode, listen, I need a favor. I need you to share it with a friend. I need more people to find all of this great board content because I think you and I both know it's really important. So give us a rating, review, subscribe. It really does help me out. It helps listeners find the cast. And if you have a question or a story to share, we would love to hear from you. Send me a note online at charitytherapy.show or leave a voice memo by calling 612-208-9120. Thanks for listening, y'all. All right, folks, that's our show. Be sure to follow me on Instagram or Twitter at Jess Birkin. 
We want to hear from you. Send us a message at our website, charitytherapy.show. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at birkinlaw.com slash sign up. Charity Therapy is a production of Birkin Law Office, PLLC. Our theme song is by Whalehawk. And remember, folks, this podcast is produced for your entertainment and is not a substitute for actual legal advice. Thank you.